I'm Howard Williams. I'm Vice President and General Manager of a company that makes building products. And we're, my division is in central Pennsylvania. We have about 360 employees at our facilities. And when we add corporate marketing and R&D into that mix, we've added about another 100 people. So central Pennsylvania is where we're located. We're part of a small multinational. We have, we're privately held. We're US owned. We operate from 25 sites in 19 countries, and we make architectural building products in the non-residential end of things. Domestic construction amounts for about 14% of our gross domestic product here, and this bill has an opportunity to really help and to inform and to grow that level of construction, not just here in the U.S., but also I couldn't find the figures for what we export relative to architectural design and relative to uh, building products as a nation as a whole. But I'm certain they're great multipliers upon that 14 million. And the areas that we're particularly interested in and think that actually help to create jobs, and we'll talk a bit more about that later, are the minimum data sets, the prioritization, uh, access to disclosure, and restricting the PBTs. Chemicals and the elimination of PBTs are at the forefront of all of our building standards. I've referenced in my written testimony the federal standards that require environmentally preferable purchasing, require that buildings are built in accordance with LEED, U.S. Green Building Standards. They're very clear. They're wonderfully explicit. Get the PBTs out of here. We interact, people interact with the building products, we interact with the furnishings within the spaces that we live and enjoy, and we also have an opportunity periodically to interact with the PBTs that are off-gassing from those materials within products. Globally, we add 78 million people to the planet every year. 90% of what we do as people is inside of a building. So it is within buildings and building materials that there's a great opportunity to make a very real difference in chemical exposure and product exposure. As a company, we now seek to know the chemistry of our building materials down to 100 parts per million. We want to know what 99.99% of our building products contain because that's the first step for us to be able to eliminate PBTs, chemicals of concern, carcinogens. But identifying that chemical composition is a costly and time-consuming process. We have to almost literally reach through layer upon layer within the supply chain and pull that information forward because disclosure is not a subject that uh, endears a researcher to many other suppliers. But it's essential. However, that work needlessly adds cost and delay to the process. There's a great business case for what we're doing. We as a company are growing. We as a company are adding jobs. And again, we're located in central Pennsylvania. The construction sectors have been hit hard. But we are growing and adding jobs because of what we're doing, because of the market reception. So there's a great business case for doing what we're doing. There's also a case, though, to be made for this is a profitable and a responsible thing to do. The result of that, though, is that access to this change and greater improvements is something that the general population doesn't always have access to. More disclosure, better understanding, or I would just even say access to disclosure, is really going to help manufacturers of our products that are wanted by other countries that we're going to be able to export and grow in our businesses. Access to that disclosure is critical. And again, environmentally preferable purchases are required. One of the basic premises of that, though, is that you use recycled material. Today, tomorrow, and for generations, we will be recycling materials that contain carcinogen materials, components, that contain PBTs. So in all of this, in this great dynamic of growth of population, in the growth of proliferation of green products and X standards, we're going to be multiplying some of these PBTs over and over and over again. And the result of that is going to be exposing more people. We strongly support data sets, prioritization of chemicals, disclosure, restricting the PBTs, and I fully recognize that this disclosure end of things is a very, very difficult subject. 
We're in business. We don't like competition to know what we're doing. We don't want them to know what we're doing. So disclosure is going to be, I think, the toughest point that you as a group have to deal with and build into this legislation. But it's a time for innovation. It's a great time for people environmentalism. The market wants these products. We're tied to it. It's just chemistry and what's going on in this world, as we heard, 90% of everything has chemistry involved in it. So what a marvelous, marvelous time where environmentalism, consumerism, and these changes can come together to make a strong America, make job growth, redefine green jobs. And the result of that is to take care of some of the unintended consequences that we face with on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you. Uh, the, the chair now recognizes Dr. Mitchell for five minutes. My name is Dr. Mark Mitchell. I'm a public health physician. And I became concerned about, um, when looking at uh, the rates of disease, I became concerned about the increase in the number of diseases that are related to the environment, um, as opposed to other diseases which were declining. Um, uh, we saw an increase in those that are related to the environment. So that's why I formed the Connecticut Coalition for Environmental Justice. Um, and I'm the president of that and also am a member of the National Work Group for Environmental Justice Policy. Uh, we work with environmental justice communities, which are communities um, that are low income, uh, communities of color that are disproportionately burdened with environmental hazards and also have increased rates of disease uh, from these environmental hazards. I'd like to talk a little bit about the exposure to these hazards throughout the chemical life cycle, uh, from extraction of chemicals to production to distribution, use, disposal, and legacy um, exposures to these chemicals. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that is. Um, H.R. 5820 goes a long way toward addressing the environmental justice um, concerns uh, throughout the life cycle, the chemical life cycle. Um, the first part of the chemical life cycle is the extraction, and these include mining communities, um, but also places like along the Gulf Coast where uh, people are being exposed today uh, to um, oil spills uh, that, are, that are washing up on their shores and being exposed uh, to chemicals uh, from the um, oil as well as the dispersants that are used to uh, disperse that, that oil. Um, there are also a number of production uh, uh, communities uh, such as Mossville, Louisiana, um, in Louisville, Kentucky, that have many chemical plants uh, as well as other industrial uh, facilities that are exposing residents to chemicals um, on a daily basis. And in these communities, they have exceptionally high pollution rates, um, rates that I believe would not be allowed in more affluent um, communities um, uh, other than Mossville and West Louisville. Uh, and we're seeing very sick people in these communities. Uh, for example, we have a 30-year-old that has a heart attack um, in the community. We're seeing uh, clusters of lupus, uh, large numbers of hysterectomies, uh, depression even, uh, and premature death. Uh, these are communities that, that I would consider to be hotspots. And hotspots is a provision uh, that's a new provision in this bill uh, that, that would require that these communities um, reduce their pollution. The next phase of, um, of use of chemicals, or the life cycle of, of chemicals, is the use uh, phase. Low-income low uh, communities uh, are even more exposed than other communities to hazards in everyday products. Uh, for example, in, uh, about a year ago in, in Connecticut, we started testing toys uh, for lead. And what we found is that toys from discount stores, such as dollar stores, um, uh, were more likely to contain lead uh, than, than other toys. And these are the, the things that are exposing low-income uh, people uh, to the, these toxics in the toys. We're also very concerned about legacy uh, chemicals. And legacy chemicals are chemicals that have, um, out use, uh, have gone past their useful life, um, but are still, people are still being exposed to these kinds of chemicals. Uh, for example, PCBs. Uh, uh, Tosca uh, banned PCBs uh, in the light, late 1970s. Um, however, people are still being exposed uh, to PCBs. 
In New Bedford, uh, Massachusetts, for example, they have two schools that are built on an old dumps that are, uh, that are still contaminated with PCBs. Um, I'm working with um, some of the housing developments uh, that uh, may also be built on the same dump. It's not clear right now. But the residents complain that when their children go out and play in the dirt, um, that, that they get rashes, and rashes are one of the um, uh, are a potential uh, issue that, that can be found with PCBs. Uh, so HB 5820 uh, requires a health-based st uh, standard and includes aggregate exposure uh, from, uh, from all sources, and it consider it, but it can consider the life cycle um, of chemical exposure um, and cumulative in, in exposure. This is important to environmental justice communities since risk assessment has uh, served environmental justice communities poorly. Uh, so in summary, we believe that this legislation goes far in addressing a number of environmental justice um, issues. We like to see the bill passed out of committee this year. Um, and I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me to this hearing. And I'm certainly willing to answer questions later. My question to you is, Dr. Dennison, you say in your testimony that HR 5820 will, will spur innovation and protect American jobs. <clears throat> Can you explain uh, in light of your statement uh, and in light of some of the testimony we've heard today, uh, some of the exact, uh, can you ex express, can you expound on your statement in light of some of the anxiety that's been expressed about the bill's potential impacts on uh, job retention and uh, creation, uh, can you express uh, and expound uh, on your position on the re retention and creation of jobs as a result of this bill? The U.S. has fallen well behind much of the rest of the world in its chemicals policies and practices. And I think one of the things that this bill will do is to raise the standards in the U.S. to those of other uh, areas of the world, including the major markets uh, of the chemicals industry. The motivation behind the improvements in those standards in other parts of the world has been as much to promote sustainability and create an, uh, a more sustainable chemicals industry as it has to protect health and the environment. And I, I, I fear that the industry in this country right now is in a similar place to where the auto industry was a decade or more ago, where it fails to recognize where the rest of the world is going and where its own markets are going. We need to have, therefore, an industry that is driven toward innovation, yes, but innovation that, that includes safety as a critical central element of that innovation. I couldn't say it better than a, a member, uh, a representative from DuPont, one of ACC's uh, companies, that said in response to the REACH regulation in Europe that they would, they as a company that invested heavily in R&D and innovation saw REACH as a business opportunity to innovate the new chemicals that would be restricted under REACH and be out ahead of the curve in terms of creating the jobs and creating the new products that will satisfy the growing demand globally for safer chemicals. Mental misunderstanding of the bill. Um, he said in his, in his oral statement and again just now that, that somehow comp an individual company would have to go out and assess the exposure not only to their use of the chemical but to everybody else on the market. That's a fundamental misunderstanding of the bill. That's a role for EPA under this legislation, not for an individual company to do those assessments. At the safety standard and the obligation to assess aggregate exposures uh, to a chemical that is bringing in the market, in no way does it state clearly that that is a responsibility of EPA. Now, if that is the intent of the authors, then that is something that we would be more than pleased to work with you. But as we read the legislation today, that is a burden and an obligation and responsibility on the industry. Written testimony, and, and you referred to this also today in your oral testimony. Um, you said the U.S. chemicals industry's competitiveness has continued to decrease substantially in recent years 
due to competition from countries like China and India with lower resource costs, lower wage standards, and a less burdensome regulatory environment. I'm going to assume that it is not your organization's positions that we should decrease wage standards and decrease the regulatory environment in the United States. Would, that's not your position, is it? Certainly not. And I would also um, ask you, I, I would think that your organization would also believe that we need to uh, renovate Tosca for a, this new century, correct? We, we do. And also, Mr. Dooley, your organization would think the same. It's not that you oppose uh, re, you know, fixing Tosca for this new environment that we have now, right? No, we have made this one of our highest priorities. Right. You, you also, and in fact, both of your organizations have been at the table during the negotiations. So I have a, I, I want to ask both of you I this would, uh, question. I would, uh, put negotiations in uh, parentheses. I, I wouldn't necessarily characterize the discussions as negotiations. Okay. Well, um, here's my question to you is, is what safety standards does your organization recommend that we adopt? We would think that we could learn some terrific lessons by looking at what Canada has done in the past couple of years and in instituting a reform of their chemical management system, which is very similar with the concepts that we've developed out, where you would develop, you would prioritize the chemicals based on the reason with those that we should be of greatest concern. So you think the Canada standards would be appropriate standards for us to look at? That the Canada scheme okay. and their system would be much more, I think, appropriate in terms of prioritizing the chemicals based on the risk of exposure and then adopting a system where you would determine how you can manage those risks for those products as they are put in the marketplace for their intended use. Thank you. Ms. Bosley, what standard would your organization add, I, safety standard? I would agree. We've, we are a proponent of Canada's system also, and I might say that the first thing Canada did was to put their arms around the exact number of chemicals in commerce. Canada had a similar number of 75 or 80,000 chemicals that were on a list called the DSL. They, through polling of industry, they pared that list down to 23,000 chemicals that were actually in commerce. Some of the chemicals were no longer manufactured or imported into Canada. Many of the chemicals were no longer manufactured. When they had that list of 23,000, they were having a much better area in order to prioritize that list and require uh, a different base set of testing depending on the highest priority chemicals. Dr. Dennison, could you just respond to the suggestions by Mr. Dooley and Ms. Bosley? I, I applaud what Canada did. As a very small country with a tiny percent of the global chemicals market and the vast majority of those chemicals being imported rather than produced there, it made sense for them to do what they did but it is far away, away from being a proper model for the United States of America. In fact, they, the, their process was hampered enormously by the enormous data gaps that led them not to be able to even classify thousands of chemicals against the criteria that they used to prioritize chemicals. Moreover, they found that many of the chemicals, in contrast to what Ms. Bos Bosley said, they actually only started with 23,000 chemicals. They didn't have 75,000 chemicals. We have a much bigger problem on our hands, and we, we need a much more systematic solution that speaks to the fact that we have a major part of the global chemicals market. Let me uh, address my first uh, couple of questions to uh, Mr. Uh, Cook. Mr. Cook, industry witnesses have expressed concern that if this bill passes, as it's written, uh, it will drive uh, innovative manufacturing outside of the United States and indeed kill high pay and American manufacturing jobs. Do you have any concerns that the global environment could suffer if we force this type of manufacturing to countries with much less robust or even indeed non-existent environmental controls? I would be very concerned if that were uh, to be the case, uh, Congressman. There's no question. I was surprised uh, to hear uh, it brought up to, by uh, uh, my, my colleague at the table that the industry is already losing jobs. We are already shipping jobs overseas, not because we've toughened our regulatory standards. Of course, we haven't done anything for 30 years but simply because it's cheaper to do business over there. That's where our chemical industry is going. 
Well, well, well uh, excuse me, Mr. Cook, but you say not because of regulatory standards. These regulatory standards that we're talking about in this bill are, are, are not inexpensive. Let me shift real quickly. I'll come back to you uh, because this issue of jobs is real important. It's certainly real important to our side of the aisle, as you can tell from the questions. Mr. Williams, I think in your or either response to a question or maybe in your testimony, you said that uh, uh, green jobs would come out of the state of Michigan. Uh, are, you, are you talking about Flint or Detroit? Where exactly in Michigan are you talking about that we're going to grow green jobs? Okay. Uh, well, I was talking about the growth of green jobs where as our product demand rises, our supplier in Michigan produces more product and hires more people to do that. But, Mr. Williams, how long do you expect that to take? The people in Michigan are suffering pretty badly I'm right sure now. They are. They're not. Uh, and candidly, I'm on your side of the aisle. I was, I was pleased as a, as a conservative Republican, central Pennsylvania, a, a county that goes Republican in every election, to be able to come here and to speak because I do think we share a tremendous number of same beliefs and values in job creation here in America. I don't want to see that. Yeah, go yes, sir. I, I understand. Of course, these aren't political questions. We're, to, we're just talking about okay. what's good for the country, whether Republican or Democrat. Okay. But let me let me shift back to uh, Mr. Cook because I had a I had another question for him. Uh, in the conclusion of your testimony, you state, hmm. and I quote: "The federal government must place a greater emphasis on biomonitoring of cord blood." Yet you also state that, and this is a quote too, detection of a chemical in umbilical cord blood does not prove that it will cause harm. Well, last November the CDC stated on the record before this subcommittee uh, that our ability to detect chemicals through biomonitoring, and this is their quote, is exceeding the ability to actually determine whether health effects are occurring. So why then should the federal government de devote more resources, a tremendous amount of resources, to an enormously expensive procedure that you state isn't an indication of health risk and the CDC states isn't offering an increasing rate of return on health risk? This well, that's, blood month. that's an excellent question, Congressman. Thank you. And um, a couple of points. First of all, the CDC is continuing to do extensive uh, monitoring precisely because they know that the raw material for the decision-making process that you need to start figuring out some of these health effects and some of their impacts is biomonitoring information. In my case, I don't think anyone should argue that because you're exposed to a chemical means that you're going to come down with the disease or illness that might be indicated by animal studies, but we find that as the American people have waited and waited and waited some more for the government to do anything to protect them by modernizing this law. They want to know what they're being exposed to so that perhaps they can take some steps on their own while the government's making up its mind. Well, yeah, yeah, and, and it's just like uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Mitchell was saying about uh, the importance of designating areas across the country as hot spots. First thing you know, these 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 folks that are working and living and maybe employed at these companies that are manufacturing companies, chemical manufacturing companies, they're going to think they li they're living in a super fund neighborhood. Uh, and I, as I said in my opening remarks, I think we're, we're scaring the heck out of everybody. Let me, let me make one last quick question, Mr. Chairman, if you'll bear with me, because I did want to shift back to uh, our former colleague, uh, Cal Dooley. Uh, you, you had some props there, and you held them up. One of them was a BlackBerry. Uh, uh, how many of your props would meet safety standard under this bill? And for the sake of argument, assume that they don't. Under this bill, how long would it take to get a comparable alternative product to the market? Excuse me. Thank you, Ken. Uh, based on our intent, uh, interpretation, if they were, in fact, subject to the safety determination, is that we, quite frankly, don't know if we could uh, gather the information on the aggregate exposure uh, that would allow EPA to make a determination whether or not we could bring that to market. We don't think we could get there. And the problem is with a new chemical, if you're saying how long will it take us to develop a new chemical, well, you have all the R&D that's going into that as well, uh, but then uh, you have to then, before you can bring that chemical to market, you're going to have to make the investment too on the data that's going to be required.
Uh, we look at that as probably being in the ballpark based on our experience with the data that we've been providing on the HPV program at EPA to be probably in the million dollar range. Uh, then you have to wait another year for EPA to make, maybe make a determination on whether or not that product is safe to bring to market. So you're, you know, you're probably looking at a minimum of two to three years before even an alternative could even be available to come into the market. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Could I reply briefly to, to that, um, Mr. Gingrey? I, I do think that um, this is not a standard that's come out of space, uh, dropped out of space. We have had this standard in place in the pesticide arena for 14 years, and 9,000 pesticide tolerances have been reviewed under that standard, the majority of which remain on the market today. They met the standard, and, the, and it required aggregate exposure assessment. Now, I'm not saying that standard gets moved over without any adjustment, but it's not as if we're starting from scratch here. Dogged determination to make sure we reform this uh, the statute and, and have the right kind of safety measures in place. I, as you know, I strongly support the legislation that's been introduced and was glad to be a co-sponsor of it. I think, again, as I've said every time I get the chance on this matter, the average American listening to this discussion would be amazed at how little we know about so many chemicals that are out there in the stream of commerce. And frankly, must view it as an abdication of the responsibility of government to act on their behalf to protect them. So I would have liked to see even stronger uh, provisions perhaps in this. I'm very happy with what's in it. And I'm incredulous at industry's insistence that this is gonna, this is gonna compromise them, handicap them whatever phrase you want to use. I have boundless confidence that the chemical industry will figure this out and keep right on going. And I also understand just on the last point that was made uh, by Mr. Dooley about how long it would take for certain things to happen. My understanding is that there's a uh, there's a faster track that can be pursued for looking at safer alternatives in some instances and so forth. So I just believe you're going to be able to assimilate these new requirements. Um, and, and frankly, there's two, there's two dimensions to this. There's the consumer protection piece, which I think is, the, is the, my first motivation. But there's also... I think the opportunity for the business community uh, to, to profit from having these new regulations in place. We're hearing all this stuff about how it's going gonna, it's gonna to undermine jobs and so forth. I actually think it's going gonna, it's gonna to improve the, the prospects of businesses that, that manufacture products that have these chemicals in them, and I'll tell you why. The more, the more the public becomes aware of the fact that there's a lot of these chemicals out there that nobody really has a handle on. I think the more, and I don't think it's because of alarmism, I think it's just their own educated perspective, the more concerned they become about using these products, whether it's because they're concerned about their children's health or they're concerned about their own health, I mean, frankly, I've started to try to minimize my use. I mean, it, it may be having an impact on the way our house looks, but I'm trying to minimize the use of cleaning products in my house because I don't know necessarily what's in those products. So people are going to start reacting to the information that's out there about there not being enough oversight uh, in place with respect to these chemicals. And I think it's going to harm the businesses and the industries that deliver those products to the public. And if we can restore confidence that these products 
have gotten the right kind of look at them, that the chemicals that go into them have been determined to be safe, etc., then people are going to be, um, they're going to be more likely to want to purchase those products and it's going to be better for business. Now, I just wanted to ask Mr. Dennison, um, getting back to this narrative about the bill hampering innovation, shifting production to developing countries and so forth. When you look at um, regulation in the U.S. and Canada and Europe, and so forth. Uh, do, you, do you subscribe to the notion that, that having this Tosca reform in place is going to significantly undermine U.S. innovation and competitiveness? Um, I think there's a very strong uh, record of better regulation spurring innovation and providing industry with the certainty as to what its targets are for meeting those regulations and for meeting consumer demand that's based on them. I think you're absolutely right to point to the consumer confidence issue. In fact, um, ACC's decision to embrace modernization of Tosca was based in large part on their concern that the consumers were losing confidence in the safety of their products. We have to have real reform in order to restore that confidence. And that means we've got to have much better information, but we also have to have a government that's able to act on that information. And that doesn't mean weakening the safety standard. If Ms. Bosley is right that many of her, uh, of SOCMA's chemicals are intermediates with very limited exposure, then they will pass the safety standard that much more easily. That's not a reason to lower the standard and to put U.S. companies at a disadvantage to other parts of the world that have those higher standards. So I, I totally reject the notion that a stronger regulatory program will impede innovation. It will spur it. I appreciate that, and I just I've run out of time. I just closed by Israel. I think, I think industry really can step, the government and industry here can partner around good, strong standards and take this thing to the next level. Everybody's going to come out the better for it, industry and the public. So with that, I yield back. Very, very briefly, yes. <laughs> um, I think there's some confusion about the scope here. I mean, first, Cal, your, your wine and beer are fine. There's an exemption right up front for alcoholic beverages. Now, but that, medical... The exemption is just, that they wouldn't be regulated by... Mr. Mr. Dennison has been recognized. He has his hand. Thank you. Um, Medical applications in drugs and so forth are not intended to be uh, covered either here. So I, I think there's some confusion. The other thing is I think there's an interpretation of this standard that somehow it is a zero risk standard, that it would drive anything that has any hazard whatsoever off the market. It is not. And in its application under the Food Quality Protection Act, it is a risk-based standard that establishes a level of risk that is deemed to be acceptable. So I, I think that's really important to understand. Yeah.